Hey guys, all right, today we're gonna be watching a, another Historia Civilis video, this time the Constitution of the Spartans. Now I have no clue what the Constitution of the Spartans entails. I have a understanding of the American Constitution, of course, a little bit of the Weimar Constitution, uh, and also a little bit of the British Constitution, as well as the Constitution of Rights and Man uh, for the French Revolution. In this constitution, I have no clue. <laughs> so I know four of the world's constitutions, and I don't know the rest of the world's. <laughs> uh, well, eh, Meiji Constitution, Japan's Constitution, I know that one a little bit. Aside from those five, no clue. So let's go ahead and, and learn about the Spartan Constitution. It occurred to me one day that Sparta, though among the most thinly populated of the states, was evidently the most powerful and most celebrated city in Greece, and I fell to wondering how this could have happened. But when I considered the institutions of the Spartans, I wondered no longer. So begins the seminal text called the Constitution of the Spartans, written by a guy called Xenophon in the early oh, so 4th century not really a constitution of the Spartans. They just, okay, that's a thing written by Xenophon, e. okay, right? Xenophon was a native Athenian who was allowed to live with the Spartans for several years, leaving us oh. the best surviving account of the Spartan way of life. If not oh. for Xenophon, okay. we would know very little of their- Now I feel stupid about my intro. <laughs> of course Sparta didn't have a constitution, it's Sparta. I don't even think Athens had had a written one. Strange customs. What were these strange customs? Basically, ancient Sparta configured their entire society to maximize military proficiency at all costs. Their incredible discipline and their ability to mobilize their entire male population allowed this tiny city to become the dominant land power in Greece. Their Greek contemporaries spoke the same language and worshipped the same gods, and yet they all looked at Sparta like they were from another planet. <laughs> so what do we know about Spartan institutions, and why did Xenophon consider them the source of Spartan strength? Sparta was a diarchy. That means that they had two kings from two royal families who were equal in power, operating in parallel. According to Sparta's founding myth, Heracles himself came from across. I'm just curious how that would work today, because obviously we have no institutions where that is the case that I know of. Um, like in Germany, what I think Germany would probably be the closest. You have a president and you have a chancellor but their roles are very different. One obviously, one of them has more government, has more, I guess, is, is on the higher, is higher above the other one, right? The chancellor is below the president, but people look to the chancellor as kind of the leader, I think, a lot of the time. Um, but that's, I, don't, I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know too much about modern day Germany. Crossed the sea with his supporters, conquering the land that would later become Sparta and enslaving the local Greek population. Oh. He then gifted this land to two of his descendants, the twins, Eurysthenes and Procles. Their descendants would go on to found the Aegead and Eurypontid royal dynasties, who together would rule the city for the next 700 plus years. That's, so according to the story that they time. told themselves, the Spartans were foreign occupiers, this was central to the Spartan identity, so central that they viewed every non-Spartan as a potential threat. This even applied to their own Weird. slaves. The descendants of the original enslaved Greeks were called the Helots. The Helots outnumbered the Spartans at, well, we don't know. I've seen three to one, I've seen seven to one, either way, a lot. Because of this, the Spartans lived in a state of constant anxiety that the enslaved Greeks would one day get their act together and rise up against their foreign overlords. The Spartans held it as almost an article of faith that if their city ever fell, the killing blow would be delivered by a Helot rebellion. 
So why did they tolerate the constant stress that came with the domination of the Helots? Yeah, what? Well, this large-scale enslavement produced a massive amount of wealth. When each Spartan male reached adulthood, the city of Sparta awarded him with an allotment of public farmland and a contingent of Helot slaves to work it. The wealth that each farm generated was enough to basically turn every Spartan citizen into a landed aristocrat. In other words, they were so rich that nobody had to work for a living. And yet, even with all of this free public farmland subsidizing the Spartan lifestyle, private property still existed. Why does this matter? Because Spartan inheritance law was so radical that it terrified everybody else in Greece. Stick with me. When a Spartan man died, his public allotment of farmland went back to the state, but his private property went to his wife. Not his son, his wife. Ooh. This may seem like a small difference at first, but consider this. Husbands dying young was an extremely common occurrence in such a militarized society. Many of these women who had inherited their husband's wealth Woman. would devote the rest of their lives to taking their small fortunes and turning them into large ones. Eventually, when these wealthy women died, their land would pass equally to their male and female children. This is the radical bit. Now, imagine a rich young woman with inherited wealth marrying an equally rich young man. If that young man died in battle, which happened a lot, his wife would inherit his entire estate and go from rich to ultra-rich. Wow. Then she had her whole life ahead of her to expand her wealth even further and pass it on to her sons and daughters. In other words, rich women tended to produce more rich women. These rich women married rich men, and during periods when lots of husbands died young, this created a snowball effect. Woman three. These ultra-rich women are sometimes <laughs> referred to as the Spartan heiresses. Aristotle wrote that in his time, nearly 40% of all Spartan territory was owned and administered by a small group of extremely wealthy women. Their wealth Damn. dwarfed every other Spartans by orders of magnitude, including the two Spartan kings. They were a political constituency unto themselves. I want to drive this point home. At times, some of the most powerful men in Sparta, even the kings, were completely dependent on loans from the Spartan heiresses. Jesus. Their influence wow. was immense. Periodically, politicians in Sparta would start talking about land reform, and every time, the Spartan heiresses would block it by flooding the system with money and buying off politicians. <laughs> the rest of Greece was horrified that such- Damn, they're really ahead of the times there, huh? Doing, doing, buying off people before it was cool. A small group of well, women I guess they made had it such cool. a tight grip on Spartan politics. Aristotle complains at length about how wealthy Spartan wives tended to dominate their less wealthy husbands, and that the entire population of women had been ruined by their, quote, intemperance and luxury, unquote. To me, intemperance and luxury just sounds like they were having a good time. <laughs> so the Spartans were ridiculously Take wealthy, that, Aristotle. but even after hundreds of years, they still obsessively thought of themselves as foreign occupiers. In their minds, they were always just one misstep away from the total destruction of their civilization. For this reason, the Spartans placed an extremely high importance on prophecy and omens. Managing a bunch of sometimes contradictory prophecies can be a full-time job, so each king had two attendants to keep track of all of this. If one of the kings had a question for one of the oracles in the region, such as the oracle of Delphi or Delphi, they would send one of these attendants to go and ask it for them. So, in a sense, the kings were the chief religious officials in the city. Their presence served as a dog, religious right, justification the for the city's continued existence, which was central to Spartan religious life. But in a practical sense, the city continued to exist because of Sparta's incredible military prowess. Strictly speaking, the kings were the only two people allowed to lead Sparta's armies. While one of the kings was on campaign, he basically transformed into an absolute monarch. His word was law. He held life and death power over every Spartan citizen, and could even confiscate property if he deemed it necessary for the war effort. The Spartan kings were entitled to a portion of everything that was captured in battle, but this didn't necessarily make them super wealthy. Being king was an expensive job. As I said before, the king's re The rules for rulers. You gotta pay your keys, remember that? Ah. Connecting previous videos we've watched to other videos. 
Big brain. Regularly, you might even say compulsively, consulted with oracles. So wait, while one king was, so what it sounded like was one king was off at war and then the other stayed at home. That's kind of a neat system because it prevents a, say, one king has control of the entire army. So pr pretty much. Well, then the other king now is in charge of the governance of the realm while the other king is off at war, if that's the case. Uh, or if they both go off to war together to lead the armies, which I'm not too sure if that's the case. It sounds more like one king goes off to war while the other stays at home, which is a neat idea because, well, of course problems could arise. The king at home could try and take over, but then the king away who's leading an army could try to come back and kick out the other king or something, I don't know. Uh, but it sounded like that was not much an issue for the Spartans. Uh, what it did do, though, is what you see with one king systems is that if a king goes off to war, maybe there's plotting back at home to usurp him, and he gets usurped. Or if he has generals, minor generals leading armies for him, they could stab him in the back. It's like... The system prevents kind of all of that. When doing this, the you know, kings were expected to make a king-sized donation to the host temple. To shortchange the temple would be to directly insult that temple's god. This was unthinkable to the superstitious Spartans. The kings had another massive expense, often overlooked. When on campaign, they had to bring some of their personal livestock with them to make animal sacrifices before virtually every that important pig. decision. If, after the sacrifice, the omens were still bad, the king had to continue making sacrifices until the omens changed. Slaughtering this many animals meant that while on campaign, the kings would just be hemorrhaging money. Animal sacrifices became so frequent that at one point, to ensure that the kings never ran out, there was a law passed that said that one piglet from every litter had to be taken and added to the king's personal livestock. That's wow. an insane number of pigs. I mentioned a, a law being passed. Yeah. The kings had nothing to do with that. Their jobs were religious and military, and that's it. Huh. Governance was left to others. Oh, so my previous point is mute now. <laughs> the people in Sparta who actually wrote the legislation were called the Ephors. Their name translates as something like the Overseers, and huh. why the Spartans called them that will become clear in a minute. Sparta had five ephors, each at least 45 years old, and each elected for a one-year term. Once an what ephor had served his terms? term, he was barred from ever serving again. I say elected, huh. but it was more complicated than that. We don't have a complete picture of exactly how this worked, but from what we can tell, the Spartans popularly elected an unknown number of candidates. And then five of those elected were chosen at random to serve as ephors for that year. In other words, we know that the selection process was randomized to a degree, but we don't know to what degree. Were there 10 candidates to choose from, or 100? We have no idea. Aristotle says that this office usually went to relatively poor Spartans, and if that's true, there may have been a lot of randomness at play. At the beginning of the Spartan Weird. New Year, when the Ephors assumed office, they immediately renewed Sparta's war against the Helots in an elaborate ceremony. The whole thing served as a reminder to all Spartans that they were not native to this land, and that in theory, they were in a state of perpetual warfare against their own slaves. In practice, the Spartans used this state of war to justify all sorts of atrocities toward the Helot population, who from what we can tell, did nothing to deserve any of it. I would encourage you to go and look some of this stuff up. It's chilling. So on their first day, the Ephors singled out the Helots. What did they do for the rest of the year? What did they oversee? They oversaw the kings. At the beginning of kings each below. new month... This is... <laughs> this is before Common Era. And here you have elect, randomly elected officials overseeing the monarchy? What? The two kings and the five ephors would get together and exchange the following oaths. 
the kings would say to the ephors, I will reign according Look, to the established face. laws of the state. And the ephors would answer, while you abide by your oath, we will keep the kingship unshaken. Kingship unshaken, what does that mean? The ephors had an incredible amount of power to exercise oversight. If the king was acting in a way they didn't like, they could hold a vote, and with a straight majority of three to two, they could formally charge a king with a crime. If a king was charged, there would be a trial. The ephors were what? responsible for collecting and presenting the evidence, and then they would join forces with another body called the Gerousia to serve together as a jury. I'll talk about them later. A jury too? If a king Whoa. was found guilty, They're a bunch advanced. of things could happen. On one end of the spectrum, he could be fined, and on the other, he could be stripped of the crown and banished from Sparta. In the case of banishment, the crown simply passed to the next in line to the throne. Remember, according to the Spartans, Heracles himself had given their kings the right to rule this land. Removing a king was bad enough, but they would never upset the line of succession. But the removal of a king was a rare occurrence. Even if a king was stuck with a group of hostile ephors, they were going to be gone in a year. The kings would have been savvy enough to know when to keep a low profile and wait for their enemies to leave office. But during wartime, the kings couldn't hide. They needed to be out leading Sparta's armies. And when they were on campaign, two ephors went with them. Two is an important number here. Two ephors couldn't do anything on their own. They couldn't charge the king with a crime or interfere in any way with the conduct of the war, but they could take notes and report to the ephors back home what they saw. Once hostilities had ceased, together they could decide if the king had overstepped his bounds. But during normal stretches of time, when Sparta was not at war, the ephors spent most of their time writing policy. Simple votes were taken between the five ephors, and with a simple majority of three, a proposal was approved. There were virtually no constraints on what they could dream up, but just because something got the approval of the ephors didn't mean that it became law. There was a mechanism for that, and we'll cover it later. Th is this a balance of power I'm seeing in ancient Sparta? What? Debates about taxes and spending obviously took up a lot of their time, but so did basic rules about morality and Spartan lifestyle. Once the ephors agreed on a piece of legislation, they would present it before an assembly of all male Spartan citizens. Once they heard the proposal, the Spartans would verbally vote yay or nay. No amendments, no discussion, just yay or nay. So if you want to summarize what we have so it's far, the two of power, kings served as kinda. Sparta's religious figureheads and military leaders, while the five ephors what? provided oversight and passed legislation with the consent of the people. Consent of the... This, this is radical for the... before Common Era. What? The fuck? There were also a bunch of smaller things that the ephors had control over. They got to decide who was allowed into and out of Spartan territory. This included merchants and diplomats and curious writers like Xenophon, whose work was crucial in the research for this video. Xenophon was able to live in Sparta for several years, striking up a close friendship with one of the kings. But even for Xenophon, his future in Sparta was always uncertain. Every year, new ephors came to power, and every year, they re-evaluated whether or not they would allow this foreigner to live in their midst. The ephors were what? always reluctant Weird. to send Spartans abroad, even if there was a good reason for it. This is because Spartans had a reputation for going hog wild once they were away from home. We're talking out of control drinking, gambling, whoring, fighting. It was like a Spartan rumpspringa. Spartans were very good at living under their strict code of conduct in their own communities, but once they were out on their own, anything was up for grabs. What else did the ephors do? Well, they took an active role in the education of children. When a group of boys graduated into adulthood, the ephors picked three from the graduating class who, in their opinion, had outperformed their peers and best exemplified Spartan values. These three boys were each then allowed to pick 100 of their peers, with the ephors scrutinizing and questioning each selection along the way. When it was all done, the three boys selected by the ephors became officers, and each boy's 100 selections became their subordinates, 
Together, they became the royal guard to one of the kings. As soon as the Ephors huh. completed their one-year term, they were hauled in before their successors to account for everything that they had done during their year in power. Basically, they had to undergo a formal review. If any of them were found to be abusing their power, their successors had the ability to punish them in any way they saw fit. The randomized selection process and the one-year terms of the Ephors could have introduced a lot of instability into the Spartan system, but this review mechanism discouraged the Ephors from trying anything too radical, maybe to a fault. Every surviving account yeah. of the Ephors is missing something important. There are no stories of any significant legislative accomplishments. None. That's weird, right? There could be a few reasons for this. Maybe everybody was scared of this formal review process at the end of the year. Or maybe it happened, but nobody was there to write it down. As it is, our sources are super patchy, and the only reason we know half of this stuff is because Xenophon happened to be pals with one of the kings. Or maybe the Ephors were constrained by an external group. I might have a theory. Hmm. That brings us to the Gerousia. The Gerousia provided oh, a check mention on the okay. power of the Ephors, which we'll get into in a minute. Gerousia means something like the Council of Elders, and it was made up of 28 members. The two kings were also honorary members, bringing its official number up to 30. Apart from the two kings, members of the Gerousia had to be men over the age of 60, and were expected to be men of merit and accomplishment. In practice, they seemed to all come from the same small circle of wealthy, well-connected families. That this would was explain an elected the stagnation position, but unlike the Ephors, these ones were held for life. When a member died, there seems to have been an intense competition for the open spot. It's hard to be certain, but some scholars believe that political factions rose up around the two royal houses, and that each faction jockeyed to get their candidate elected. So what did the Gerousia do? This body was allowed to set aside any decision that was approved by the assembly of Spartan citizens. In other words, they had veto power. Yeah, all right. The Ephors yeah, could write that. the legislation, yep. the Spartan citizens could approve it, and at the last minute, the Gerousia could step in and be like, nah, we're good. They could even take it one step further. The Gerousia set the agenda for every meeting of the assembly which meant that the Ephors could have all of this lovely legislation written, and all the Gerousia had to do was say, no, that's not going on the schedule. Since the Ephors only served for one year, the Gerousia could easily block them until a new batch was elected. As you can imagine, the Gerousia had a significant conservative influence on the Spartan political culture. Reforms were not going to happen unless the Gerousia was on board. Maybe if you're good. When an assembly of Spartan citizens were voting, the Gerousia had a super weird job. Members of the Gerousia would sit in another building, not far from the proceedings. The Ephors would preside over the meeting and present their legislation, and the people would vote on it. Again, voting was done verbally. The Gerousia, sitting a short distance away, could not see what was going on, but they could hear the voting. After the vote, the Gerousia would come forward and announce which side was louder. The louder side won the vote. The idea was that this would keep the Gerousia impartial, but I mean, they were still allowed to veto the results if they didn't like them. As I mentioned before, if a king was on trial, or a citizen was on trial for a serious crime, like murder, the Ephors and the Gerousia joined forces to form a 35-person jury. Presumably, since the kings were honorary members of the Gerousia, they got to be on the jury to their own trial. Weird. A simple majority decided the result, and since the elected members of the Gerousia held 28 of the 35 seats on the jury, they always held the balance of power. Huh. Just in case right. anything they did ever went Maybe to trial, so the kings liked to informally consult with the Gerousia before any major decision. It made the old men feel important, and if the Ephors ever decided to come after the king, it was always nice to know that he had acted with the Gerousia's consent. 
Sparta was a notoriously cautious and conservative state, and it's clear to me that the Gerousia was the primary institutional source of that caution. Writing centuries after Sparta's decline, the Roman politician Cicero, you know, that guy, he yeah, that praise guy. upon yeah. the Spartan system. He liked how the kings were always hyper aware that they could be removed from office at a moment's notice. He liked how the ephors had to justify all of their actions to their successors at the end of their term. He liked how powerful the Gerousia was, and how these wise old men could balance competing interests or shut down legislation if things were getting out of hand. He thought that this was an incredibly stable way to build institutions, and as a conservative, Cicero loved stability. Xenophon agreed, calling Spartan institutions and the stability they provided the source of its strength. But in the end, maybe it was too stable. At the height of its power, Sparta was able to mobilize its entire male citizenry into an army of at least 20,000, maybe more. 150 years later, in Alexander the Great's time, this number had shrunk to 1,000 men, for unknown reasons. This is one There's one account of a catastrophic earthquake killing thousands of Spartans, but this alone does not explain the city's decline. Well, if they're in a constant state of war... Uh, just natural population decline of Spartan-born citizenry could explain it. Um, it's a mountainous area, maybe crop shortages. Why Alexander the Great's father, Philip, felt comfortable shrugging off Spartan threats. 150 years after that, when the Romans started getting their hands dirty in Greece, Sparta was nothing more than an insignificant village, a curiosity, still living under kings and ephors and the Gerousia, and still observing their strict ancient customs. The causes of this precipitous decline are not known to us, but maybe, over the course of those 300 years, a key reform or two could have triggered a recovery. Maybe increasing the immigration rate from zero would have helped. Maybe they could have offered citizenship to a certain number of helot slaves. Maybe they could have relaxed their strict marriage laws. You know, reforms, ideas, solve the problem. This is what governments are for. Yeah, reform! Despite their worst fears, the Spartan invaders were never overthrown by a helot uprising or by a coalition of angry Greeks. Instead, they allowed themselves to wither and atrophy, only to be conquered by another set of invaders who saw them as nothing more than a bunch of archaic freaks left over from a more illustrious time. I was not a guy. I, I was. You know, I don't know why at the beginning I thought it was an actual constitution, <laughs> it was just a thing written by Xenophon. Uh, that was an oopsie. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Damn good video by Historia Civilis, as always. Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know, like, most of this shit. I knew about the diarchy. I knew about the mobilization of the Spartan peoples. I knew about the helot slaves and the anxiety there. But I didn't know about the... Uh... I already forgot the names... <laughs> The, the Council of Elders and then the five randomly elected uh, representatives. That I did not know. That was interesting to hear about, uh, to learn about too. Um, but uh, yeah, that is the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to, leave, remember to leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.